Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's live q and I am here with Sharice from Pieces Calligraphy. Welcome, Sharice. Thank you. <laughs> we were having some technical difficulties a minute ago, so <laughs> we've gotten it all worked out now. But um, I frankly would be shocked if anybody in this group didn't know who you were, but I guess that that kind of still happens sometimes. So for everybody who might not know who you are, can you just give us a little background of who you are, what you do, that kind of stuff? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Sharice from Pieces Calligraphy, and I am a brush calligrapher. So I started this calligraphy thing a couple of years ago um, in 2014 when I was looking for something fun to do. I just saw it on a friend do it on Instagram and I asked her about it and she pointed me to a book. Then I looked for a class in town and then I just went down that rabbit hole of Instagram, which I'm sure a lot of you guys know about. And then I tried to teach myself everything in the beginning, point and pen, chalkboard, um, lettering. I was playing with Sharpies and Microns, but then I really got a hold of the, the Tombow dual brush pens. And then I just realized that there was a lot more brush pens out there than the Tombow and my world was just blown. And so um, after some time, I really committed to the brush pen and I was sharing my work and people were asking me all these questions. So then once I got questions like, do you have a website? I was like, no, but I'll make one. So I made a website. People asked if I had a YouTube channel and I didn't. So I made one. And then people were asking if I taught workshops and I was super excited to just try it out. And then I've been teaching for about two years now, um, a couple of online different teaching um, things like courses and fun um, opportunities. So that's kind of where I'm at. And so now I'm just kind of still working full time and doing this when the kids go to sleep um, and then just trying to find out how I could do more, teach more and just um, keep sharing what I know with, with everyone. So I love the background because number one, the fact that you still have a full-time job is I think shocking to a lot of people. Um, but the other part that a lot of people wouldn't know is that, uh, I mean, my background is very, very similar to yours, but the interesting part about that is there might be a reason for that. And the reason might be how you and I actually first spoke, which, which oh, is an right. interesting story. So uh, do you want to talk about that a little? Uh, for, about your story? About how we first got in touch. Yeah, um, you reached out to me. <laughs> I mean, we were we kind of knew of each other in the lettering community. And um, but at that point, remember, but I just remember being point, on the phone with you in my car. At that point, I was like, I mean, you were you were like the name in brush calligraphy. It wasn't as popular at the time. And like, I mean, if, if someone wanted to learn brush calligraphy, you were like the resource to go to. Aww. And um, and yeah, I think you were one of the first ones that I followed. And so I had initially just I was like, ah, oh, she probably won't answer, but I'll send her a message and just like ask her, you know, some questions. And you were just like, do you want to hop on a phone call? And I was like, yeah. Uh, yeah. So anybody who's listening, don't ever be afraid to reach out to those people you admire, because then we had a conversation. And now why I say my story is probably similar to yours is probably because you gave me the advice for how to go about all of it. <laughs> I know. I'm super proud of you. Um, I always feel kind of like, oh, my gosh, that phone call in the car when I was like, OK, I have a few minutes. It's faster to call than to text. Um, and I just remember you were soaking everything in and you're like, okay, I'm going to put it to work. And then I swear I blinked and now <laughs> you're just doing amazing things with the community. And it's, it's super fun um, rooting for you, like on the sidelines. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> what's next from you? <laughs> well, I always, I always try and tell people about community over competition and it's another good example mm -hmm. of that. So I think a lot of people are afraid to reach out to other artists or like, you know, step on people's toes by trying to do similar things. But usually right. if you're open to it and whatever, it just ends yeah. up being helpful instead of hurtful. Mm -hmm. And and truthfully, it's just kind of a matter of time. I mean, I see everyone's messages and I can only get to so many. So you kind of got me at a good time when I like <laughs> didn't have my inbox at like 300 unread messages. <laughs> so um, that's another thing too. You just don't know when the best time is. So whether that's trying to collaborate with someone, trying to ask for help, trying to learn, just do it. Just try to put yourself out there and um, don't be afraid of being rejected either because it happens. But yeah. Have to try. <laughs> yeah. So that's an interesting side note. But anyway, 
I love that. So you're still working full time. Mm -hmm. I have the day off. So in case anyone's wondering, um, I do have a schedule where I have um, every other day off. So or every, whoa, I wish every uh, a day off every other week. So that happened to be today um, on purpose. And so, yeah, I'm working full time. Um, I have overtime. I just have to be logged on pretty much all the time. But and you have three young bills. <laughs> what's that? And you have three young children. And I have three young children. My boys, um, they're twins and they're, they just turned five and then their sister just turned one. <laughs> so if anybody is listening and thinks they don't have time to make all of this happen, <laughs> you have time to make this happen. <laughs> it take, it's, it's slow. It's a slow process, but you, you can't be um, discouraged when life, I mean, uh, a quote someone told me was that the kids and life aren't the distractions, like they are the important work. And so that was really hard for me to wrap my brain around because I'm like, I just want to write <laughs> and teach. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's amazing that you're doing all of that. Um, so I think the best thing to do is to just get right into the lesson. So I yeah. think um, like I mean, like I said before, you're really known for the beginner stuff like the best go-to resource you can type in how to learn brush calligraphy and pieces calligraphy will come up. So I think most people in here have come across your stuff before, uh -huh. but maybe not the five like most common mistakes. Right. So I think it'll be really interesting to kind of see what your five mistakes are. If you want to just jump right into that, I can take my face off the screen and <laughs> give the action to you. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So let me hop you around here. You can kind of see my messy studio. And there's Becca. <laughs> okay. So it was really um, a neat topic, or actually, let's have you over here to talk to you guys about what the five. Um, is that okay? Yep. Okay. And then I'm going to purposely use a larger brush pen just so you could see the lettering a lot better. Um, but, um, and I don't know if this is helpful for you to see this as well, just to go over it really quickly. So um, I have this um, PDF that I shared with Becca and she helped me make it, so. Yeah, so um, if for anybody who who's watching this, if, and you wanna grab that PDF, Sharice has made this available to all of us. So if you go to my website, thehappyevercrafter.com, slash pieces dash calligraphy and I'm putting that link up on the screen for you guys. Um, you can go grab that PDF right now if you want to follow along or you can download it later just as a as a reference for later on. Right. Um, but that's that's the PDF that Sharice is using right now. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I'll just um, read them really quickly but then we'll go into each one. So holding the pen vertically is um, a common mistake and maybe not so much exactly vertically but just not holding it um, at the right angle. So just being aware of that, holding the pen in the wrong direction, applying too much pressure onto your pen, not lifting after every stroke, and then not using guidelines, which you see back here. And so um, let's go ahead and just jump right into the first one. I have some paper back here, and um, it sounds like Becca's gonna link to all of this for you or, or share this info. Um, so you're using Rhodia paper, right? Right. So I'm going to use Rhodia for the um, for everything except the the last one because obviously guidelines. Um, I want to point you to this paper. But for the first one, um, now you'll have to um, don't mind my camera angles. So I love sharing with my students. Like if this was your aerial view, let's see. There we go. You wouldn't want to hold your pen straight up to the ceiling because what's happening is, um, and here's like a side view. When you hold the pen up to the ceiling, you don't have space for that tip to bend. And the way brush pens work are they, they bend at the tip here. And so, um, I hope this is the right angle. This is kind of hard for me with the... It's hard with the camera, yeah. Yeah, because of what we were talking about earlier, seeing it backwards. Would it be helpful to do this? Can you see my angle better this way? Yep. Okay, great. Sorry for that um, point there. So if I'm holding it up to the ceiling, this pen tip doesn't have anywhere to bend. But if I bring it down at an angle, so now I have this sort of 45 degree angle to my page, then if I press down, then I get a thick stroke. If I press down a little bit, I can get a medium stroke. If I don't press down at all, I could just keep it on that tip. 
Okay, so it's this ability to press against the page without kinking it or fraying it. Because if you hold it too upright, it's not like a paintbrush where the bristles will spread out, but then they'll come back together. These pens, the brush marker pens are made out of felt and this material is really sensitive to being pressed down at the wrong angle. So that's the, the first mistake that you wanna avoid. And the easy fix for that is just to bring it down to an angle. Okay, so just that side view again. So here is going up right. Imagine uh, my pen is facing the, is, is pointing up to the ceiling here. But then if I bring it down at an angle, then you can see how it can bend. Is that something you can see? Yep. Cool. I really love that, that angle because you can really see the bend in the pen. Okay, and this goes for all brush pens. There is some, there are some pens that are a little bit more stiffer and some that are um, more flexible, but in general, it's about pulling it down at that angle. Okay, so we're already getting messy here. The second <laughs> thing I wanna point out is um, if I have, let's do another um, line here. So if I'm trying to, um, if here's my baseline, and I want my letters to be on this slant. So if I'm doing my letter A, I want my thick strokes on that slant line. If I'm doing a letter B, I want the thick strokes along that slant line. And people have asked me, what do I mean on the slant line? What I'm talking about is these thick strokes here are parallel to that slant line. Like if they were to land on, if, if you looked at where they are aligned, they're, they're parallel to this slant line. So sorry for the math lesson in case some of you guys are cringing, but this is all, this will all make sense. So what happens is, now remember the first tip I said to hold your pen at an angle, but there's another part to that and you want to point it in the right direction because if I'm holding my pen at an angle, I could hold my pen at an angle this way. I could hold my pen at an angle this way. So it's still at an angle, but where is it pointing? So what I tell students is to look at the tip here and point it perpendicular, another math term. So perpendicular, remember, is 90 degrees. So this is, this is my arrow. You wanna point it so that it makes a T. Okay, so see how here's my slant line, here's my pen. You don't want the pen coming out, coming down this way, coming down this way. And this is different than pointed pen because pointed pen, you actually do want to point it with the slant line. With brush pen, you want to point it perpendicular to the slant line. So look what happens when I put my thick, when I make my thick strokes pointing at that slant line, I'm able to easily put the strokes down where I want them. If it was pointed, say, this way, I couldn't really make the thick, the, the thin and thick strokes as easily. Like it's just kind of an awkward position. If it's pointed from down below here, there's no, it, I wouldn't be able to bring the thin and thick strokes. You need the side of that pen. Okay, so that's the second point. And one, um, another extra tip for this is if you're having trouble finding that perpendicular angle, um, and you have to forgive me, I can't totally turn my page with the camera here, but you wanna rotate your page. Instead of having your hand be the one to twist and turn, you would keep your hand comfortable, but you would rotate your page until you find that direction. All right, so let's do number three. And number three is applying too much pressure. So a lot of times in the beginning, I see very heavy hands of not having that diff that different amount of pressure. And what ends up happening is you have these thicknesses everywhere. And what you wanna do is practice applying less pressure. So really this pen could get as light as this stroke here, these strokes, and it can get as heavy as this stroke or even heavier. So this variation, it's kind of like this scale you wanna use that to your advantage. So when you see this example, there isn't very much variation in the strokes because there's just too much pressure. So let's do this again and you'll see if I am mindful of where I put the pressure and I lift and I 
um, sorry, getting to getting ahead to the next to another step, but let's just focus on the pressure. If I focus on lessening my pressure in certain areas, then see the difference. We kind of chisel, I like using funny terms, like chisel off some of that thickness. And now it's a little bit more elegant and you have this play on the different stroke sizes. So this is fine if you wanna do regular lettering. And you know what, I just have to put a side note here. My calligraphy background is really leaking into this whole lesson because I realize if you do purposely want to do lettering, this is totally fine. So I don't mean to say that this is wrong, but I just want to show you the power in using pressure um, and, and knowing how much pressure to place. Does that make sense? So instead of feeling like you always want to have a heavy hand, you can actually play around with the different um the different amounts of pressure that you put on your letters and get a very different look. So I want to just clarify that, that it's not so much a mistake, but if you are going for like a calligraphy look, or maybe you want to just have a little bit of variation and make this um, not too heavy, then you want to practice different amounts of pressure to get the look you're going for. And Sharice, do you notice that um, that like the pressure differences is directly correlated to how quickly you write? Um, yes and no. In the beginning, yes, because in the beginning, I would try to write really fast and it, I would do this flicking motion where I was thinking that I was releasing my pressure here at this point. But what was happening was I wasn't lifting and loosening my pressure soon enough that it was still heavy when I flicked it up. So even though I got to my lighter pressure up here, it was staying so heavy. So what I did was I would slow down and even though it was shaky, I would really watch when I would get to a point. And then even though I was, um, I chose to go over form than shakiness. So what I'm trying to say is over time, once you get that muscle memory going, then you can get faster. So it's kind of like the order of what you, when you do things, if you're doing it too fast without having the right knowledge and muscles, you could risk having that that heaviness that you may not want. Okay, so then now when I write really fast, I'm able to kind of find when to get to that lowest pressure that I want. Whereas in the beginning, it was a little bit too fast, too hurried. It's kind of like trying to run before you walk. You just may not be as graceful. <laughs> so um, you'll still get there, but something to keep in mind. I find that like whenever I do demonstrations, I just naturally go a little bit faster than I used to because like you said, the muscle memory is there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, once the muscle memory kicks in, you can go as fast as you want because you your hand just has that habit. But mm -hmm. in the beginning, I always try and tell people if they're having trouble to slow down. And like you said, they often find that the slower they go, the shakier it is, which right. like you said, it's at the beginning more important to focus on the shapes rather than the shakiness and the shakiness goes away over time. Oh, totally. I could give you a million analogies. I'm like analogy queen, but my one of my favorite ones is like running. When you first run, you're slower, you're achy, but the more you do it, you'll be able to go faster and not even think about each step. You can think about going further. So just I relate that. to that one. I've been running lately and I hate it so much. <laughs> Every bone, you're like, why am I doing this? Exactly. Yeah. But you do get better very quickly. Totally. Yeah. Okay. So you're ready for the next one? Mm -hmm. um, so not lifting is the next mistake. Okay. So what you're probably used to, if you're if if calligraphy and lettering is new to you. And I, I, again, my background in calligraphy is kind of more, um, I'm more of a calligrapher. So, but this does apply. When you are doing your letters, a lot of people mistake in calligraphy and lettering for cursive. So what, what happens is they think that they can just not lift their pen. And what ends up happening is there's this overlap that you don't really... It's okay if you're going for that look. So again, I'm not trying to say that things are wrong, but what's important is to be mindful and intentional. So here's something that I do to kind of give myself a little bit more breathing space for my letters. So if you look at these areas right here, I'm putting little triangles to show you the difference in where I lift my pen after each stroke. So if I do this again, I have my oval here. I lift my pen so I can place this next stroke. 
Okay, and then I'm going to do my letter B. It's just, it allows you to open up your letters a little bit more. Okay, um, I, don't, I don't think this was the best example, this B to C, but let's look at this B right here, this A to the B. So you just have that opened up space instead of it being so bottom heavy right here. And then another example too is like the letter N. If you don't lift your pen and you're a right-handed person, you may get something that looks like this, which is fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with this letter N, but what happens is the tip of your pen is right here. And so that next stroke comes out this way. So then, and I'll give you a lefty example in just a second. So if you instead lift your pen tip to the right side of that thick stroke, then you can come out here and now you give yourself a little bit more space. Okay, so it's just about the, the look you're going for. So for a, a lefty, and I'm not, dom my dominant hand is right, but I can try to do my best to demonstrate. So I'll bring you down here a little bit. So if I, uh oh, it's not focusing. Okay, if, I if, if I'm making a letter U, for example, and I don't lift my pen and I just press down from here. Okay, ooh, let's try that one more time. So I make a U. I was about to I, say your your left-handed lettering is very impressive. Is it? <laughs> well, and then you and then you had that shakiness. <laughs> <laughs> I've been practicing. Um, I may or may not have a secret goal of trying to write left-handed. No, so, no, you as don't. Well, so do I. I don't practice it, but in my mind, I will. It's it's on my bucket list. <laughs> cool. Um, we can start a new Facebook group, ambidextrous letterers. <laughs> So as a lefty, the pen tip is on this edge now, right? So as I go up here to this next stroke, if I don't lift and I press down, now that stroke comes back here. But instead, if I were to lift after that stroke, then I can place my pen out this way. And then the thickness of that next stroke will... So see how the pen tip ended here? Now it's ending, now I'm starting here and I can bring that thickness out here, okay? So it's just another way of opening up your letters so that this stroke here has all of the space that you were hoping for, whereas this one, it gets a little bit compressed and just um, I like congested, is that um, an okay word to use? I, I like my letters to breathe and be graceful. Okay, so. Um, so hopefully we get out of time because I can go off forever. Oh, you got lots of time, but we got an interesting comment um, oh, from sure. Kathy. Kathy said when she was doing Show Me Your Drills, which is my program, um, uh -huh. that to remember to lift every time she used a different color for the strokes and it slowed her down. And I know that you do that a lot too. Yeah, I call it my fancy two color technique, which is not really <laughs> a fancy term, but yes, um, good point. I'm glad you guys do that too because um, a great drill, for example, like let's do a couple of underturns, is to change colors after every stroke. And what that does is not only does it force you to lift your pen, but it forces you to see where each stroke falls. Whereas if you used the same color, you may not see that difference, right? And so that's a great, I love that, um, that trick. And you can apply this to anything. It doesn't have to be the same stroke. It could be different letters. So you could see how each letter form is created. So then if I did my oval here, I could see where the strokes align with each other. So I'm purposely having that entrance stroke rest on the outside of that stroke. I'm making sure this oval doesn't overlap too much with this underturn. And if you didn't do that, you may do something like this and you not and not notice it. And I see this a lot and people wonder why their letters look just kind of off. And so what's happening is this stroke is sort of piercing that, that oval and it's not really resting on the outside. And then this stroke here is really overlapping with this oval. Awesome. All right, so last but not least, which is perfect because I kind of ran out of pay, uh, paper um, space, is to use guidelines. So a mistake is to just if you're like me in the beginning, you took a blank piece of paper, you grabbed a marker and you swished your pen and you thought that you were lettering, which you were. 
But what I didn't realize was why, for example, I would start out with my letters and it would fall off to the side or it would start off one size and somehow get smaller. And so I was wondering how these letters and calligraphers on Instagram were writing so nicely. They were using guidelines. So it could be as simple as um, and of course, I don't have a ruler handy, but you guys know oh, here. You guys know what a ruler looks like. It could be as simple as taking a ruler and even just giving yourself an X height, okay? And an X height is just a space where your lowercase X falls and fits. So then you could practice writing in here. And this is kind of, I made this pretty big, but if you practiced keeping your letters within this space, then for sure you would, I'm just gonna make up some strokes, then definitely you would be able to keep that consistency and and focus on the sizing of your letters whereas if you didn't have that then you wouldn't um, obviously have that guide so there's a couple of things you can do you can make your own guide guidelines by using a ruler you can use griff uh gr whoa gra <laughs> graph paper like this i love the roadie notepads they also come in lined and dot um, styles and then there's also printed guide sheets and i have these um, on my website that you can download. And I'm not the only one with guide sheets. There are a ton of people who share guide sheets. This is just one that I actually had um, my good friend Nina make for me because I wanted it to be a little bit, not so much um, on the 55 degree. This is actually 65 degrees. So if we really want to get technical, um, this is 65 degrees and it's about six or seven millimeters. And when I say six or seven millimeters, I'm referring to the X height here. So now what this allows us to do, and I'm using a smaller pen here. Um, and so if I were to do my letters, I could do, I could apply everything we just went over, the lifting, the holding the pen at an angle, holding my pen at, a, at the perpendicular direction to my slant line, and I could still create my letters. Okay, now the purpose of using guidelines is to, to be intentional. I've had, I've heard some complaints about this being too much at a slant. So that's totally fine. You could just use your graph paper and then you could make your letters more upright. And so in this case, my slant line, and I know that's kind of contradictory that a slant line would be upright, but if my slant line was upright, then I would just wanna make sure my pen is facing that and being perpendicular to the slant line that way. So now when I do my letters, I'm pointed in that direction. So every time I go down, my, my shades, the, the thick parts of my letters go along that slant line, okay? And then just to go back and reiterate again, if my slant line's this way, then I would, if, instead of being this direction to that slant line, then I would rotate my page. I'm keeping my hand comfortable because you want to preserve your energy and your, your strength. And then I would now turn my letters. And so in just that little fix of rotating your page, now I can do the same letters, but my shade goes on the slant line in the new direction. And so I always love kind of... Um, critiquing my own work and just seeing how, so this one's a little bit off of that slant line, but it's okay, Just it's just this intentional practice of realizing everything you do matters. And so that's kind of my philosophy with teaching. I get pretty technical, academic, you can say, but I love it. I love having this um, foundation. And sometimes I think I open up people's eyes a little too much and then you're just, it might be um, overwhelming to see it that way, but hopefully that's helpful in applying that to other types of lettering. You can kind of see how these concepts and these mistakes, quote unquote, but if we fix them and learn how to how to deal with them, you could just be a little bit more intentional with your lettering. I think I don't think that it's a, a downfall to be technical like that. I think it's really important, especially at the beginning. It's like that Picasso quote where you got to learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist oh, if, you yeah. don't have, if you don't have that foundation then you're kind of going in blind and it can just turn into a big mess right 
I love that. I love that. Um, I love comparing that to kind of a, like a sport where there are rules to the sport. And a lot of us kind of, you know, you kick a soccer ball or you pick up a basketball and that's fine. But then when you really learn what you're doing, then that can help in your game, in your skills. But if you just figure it out on your own, sometimes it, it, that you don't learn it as fast or you develop bad habits that are later harder to break. Yeah, so, for sure. So yeah. I've just um, I've just opened up the floor to questions, but I think that um, it's safe to put the camera back on your face now. <laughs> back on my face? Okay, hopefully um, I'm not a mess over here. These lights are kind of warm, so. <laughs> Okay. Hello. I feel you. I sit in front of a, a really huge window and um, this natural, like the sun will just beam in and make me mm -hmm. so hot all day. Um, yeah. But we did get a couple questions. So two people asked this question, actually. Ashley asked it originally and she's wondering, how much time did you spend practicing when you first started? Oh, great question. I get that a lot because I think the idea is that you need to practice for hours and truthfully, I didn't have that. When I first started, I had the kids. And so my boys were like two or three at the time. Um, I can't put a number to it. And so I hate saying I just practiced when I could, but literally I practiced when I could. And so whether you have five minutes a day or you do have an hour, what I usually tell folks learning is that it's more about being intentional and doing the right practice. I hope that's helpful because I know it, you're kind of looking for a number like, do I need to practice for 15 minutes? Well, if you practice the same stroke for 15 minutes and you felt like from that beginning to the end, you even just made one light bulb moment, that's a great practice. You could practice for an hour and not do any and be making these mistakes that we talked about and not get anywhere and be kind of in the same area you were to begin with. So instead of putting a number to it, I would just kind of focus on what, where are you at with your lettering in the moment? And then what are the small things that you could do to improve and then spend the time you have doing those. But if you do have hours, great. I mean, I think more practice is always helpful, um, but being intentional is, is better than hours and hours on end. <laughs> For sure. And actually, the other person who asked the same question, the second part of the question was, is there ever too much practice? There is. I, I truly think if you practice too much, you could risk um, kind of just overwhelming yourself and almost losing your excitement over the lettering. Um, and so in a weird way, I literally sometimes walk away from the pens. Um, sometimes life takes me away from it. So in a, in a natural way, I get a break from it. But I think if you're um, like with a little bit of too much, uh, too much of anything could be harmful. Um, but if you take those breaks and then you kind of come back refreshed, it's OK to practice for a lot of a, a long time. Um, I would just listen to your body. If you feel tired, if your mind is, you don't feel creative, if you're feeling discouraged, I can't tell you, I'm one, you know, I will be the first to admit that being on Instagram too long, looking at your pens and hoping that the letters come out right, it can be frustrating. So just listen to your body and take breaks um, when you need to. Well, and I think those two points kind of go together. It's like mm -hmm. the minute you have been doing it for too long and you notice you're no longer being intentional about it and you're just kind of like phoning yeah. it in just for the sake of practicing, then it's no longer useful if you're not being intentional. So, right, right, definitely. Um, okay, we had another question. Mariella asked, at what point can you consider that you're no longer a beginner? <laughs> That's a good question. I actually heard something recently. Um, oh, I can't remember what it was a podcast. I'm always listen, listening to podcasts and there's like three stages to learning. And the first one is, um, is like imitation because we all have to copy someone right um, in the beginning just to learn the steps. And then there's assimilation and then there's innovation. And I thought that was really neat because it's okay to copy. You just don't want to pass others work as your own if you're in the learning stage. But once you pass that, okay, I don't have to look at you know, like Sharice's letters or Becca's letters, or, you know, I actually know what the letters look like. You're kind of moving on from that beginner stage because now you're kind of, maybe you pull inspiration from around you and then you get the, the itch to write just what comes out from your own hands. And so at that point, I would, I, I personally felt like I wasn't a beginner anymore. Um, in the beginning, 
you know, when you're a beginner, you you kind of forget, okay, wait, thick strokes go down and then goes up or, or these mistakes that we talked about, you're still trying to tell yourself those things. But once you're not even thinking about that, then I would say you kind of pass that stage, which is awesome. And then you can start bringing in new ideas or um, just finding your style. A lot of people try to ask me, like, how do you find your style? And it's just going through that process. Yeah, you kind of start to naturally find your style when you're getting mm -hmm. out of that beginner phase. Right. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, okay, so we I, I popped a couple of the names of the pens you were using up on the screen, but the next question is, what's your advice and which tools are better to use for beginners? Oh, good question. Okay, so um, my answer has changed to that over time. I used to say, um, and to some degree, I still believe this, that any pen you have is the best because what my, my intention was that was I didn't want people to get hung up on having the perfect pen. So when I said that before, I said, oh, any brush pen is perfect. You just have to learn how to use it. So that's the, the idea with that, again, is don't wait for the perfect pen to get started. If that's all you have, go for it, just use it. But on the flip side, to, to really focus on a certain pen, um, and, and this question I'm assuming is kind of what's the best pen, right, would you say? Yeah. Um, I have gravitated now towards pushing folks to learn with the smaller pens. Um, and then as I, as I say that, I have another exception to that rule, but I love the Pentel sign pens, the Kuretake Fuda Gokachi pens, and, um, and Becca, we didn't mention, this, I didn't mention this one earlier, but the Tombow Fuda no Fudanosuke pens, anything that's kind of smaller, it's, it mimics like your regular pencil or your regular pen. So to me, it takes away that unnatural feeling of whereas the Tombow dual brush pen, I love this pen. This was like my first brush pen, but it's huge. And so getting used to that large pen, the pen tip is way bigger than these smaller pens. And so what that ends up doing is you're having to learn how to use a large pen a large size pen and then trying to learn lettering. So if you can take away some of that unfamiliarity with the pen, then that's a great way to start. And then so that exception I mentioned, um, at, the reason why I love teaching with the large pens though, is that you can see the transitions better. And so if you think of like a little kid writing for the first time, right, they use the big Crayola markers and the big, big pencils. So in a way, if you're okay dealing with the large pen, it could be beneficial, especially because what we're doing here, it deals with a lot of transitions and you want to see that difference when you're writing on a smaller scale, it's harder to see that. So I hope that wasn't too much information. I hope that was helpful to kind of um gauge like what maybe what's more comfortable for you um so again I, I would highly recommend using the large pens in in studying and practicing but i truly do think that the smaller brush pens are easier in the beginning to handle i think the one i i completely agree with all of that advice i think the one main difference to note is that if you're going to practice with those big pens that you have to be doing them on a bigger scale because a lot of people try and use the same guidelines with the small pens and the big pens and it just turns into a big jumbled mess and then you're oh. defeating the purpose of trying to see the bigger transitions because you're doing them small right right so that's another thing we could have a whole nother lesson on that just knowing the right size guidelines to use and i didn't include this in the pdf because i didn't want to write way too much but in general, if you want to make a note of this, smaller pens, I like to use an X height. So that space in between your lines, about five to 10 millimeters. I know that sounds super specific, but it's for a reason. You don't want your, you don't want to write on too large of a scale either, because then it just gets too awkward. Um, but for the larger pens, and I, I don't have these guidelines handy, but um, they are on my website. The larger pens, I like to keep that X height at least 10 millimeters, but as big as 15 millimeters, just to really get the, the large, um, just match the scale of, of that writing. For yeah, sure. that makes a lot of sense. So mm -hmm. you said that those guidelines are all on your website, right? Is that piecesclear.com right. slash learn? Yes, so okay. if you kind of scroll down to the end of that page, I have this free um, printables, free guide sheets. And, um, and that is under construction, I, but the links are all good. So you can find guide sheets there that are on a larger scale so that you can do um, similar work, but with a 
with a size that works for the large pens. So speaking of your website, where else can people find you? Like, where are you focusing most of your energy right now? What's going on in the world of Pieces Calligraphy? Yeah, I'm glad you asked because uh, PiecesCalligraphy.com is my home base. But you can find me really active, like on a day to day basis on Instagram. I, um, it's kind of where I started. So at Pieces Calligraphy. And so I'm, I'm kind of a mix of sharing Instagram stories just on a day to day um, I kind of toggle between um, sharing on my newsfeed. So other than Instagram, YouTube is where I've been really enjoying sharing more content just because it's a little bit more permanent than Instagram stories. And so if you go to youtube.com slash pieces calligraphy, um, I'm actually in the middle of an alphabet challenge. So I've been hopping on live and that's been a new thing for me. But otherwise, I try to post um, weekly to that channel. So all of those things are super helpful. Um, you have good tutorials and stuff on there. Do you have any courses that are actually open right now too? I do. So my kind of my signature course, it's like my full A to, a to Z course, um, that's always available. So if you go to learnbrushcalligraphy.com, that is where you will find it. And I'm in the, I'm kind of in the, a, a, a part two is in the works is what I'm trying to say. So right now that is like your standard um, learn everything from the beginning. And I walk you through a ton of lessons. You'll get videos, you'll get um, more downloadable guide sheets. And then I have a Facebook group where I hop in. Um, it's not just the Facebook group. I actually hop on live on YouTube just with the students every month. So that's pretty fun. Yes. And then you can also find me um, in another a, a couple of other places. If you go to my website under, um, I believe, online courses, you'll see um, other opportunities to find me online. Awesome. Good to know. Yeah. So, I mean, we're not getting questions rolling in, so I think you must have answered everyone's questions right, <laughs> right away. Um, so, again, if anybody wants to grab Sharice's free um checklist of the stuff we talked about today you can go to the link that's on the screen right now um, and download it for free there and there will be a whole recap of this conversation with the blog post and this video will be on youtube afterwards as well um, so thanks so much Sharice. that was awesome thank you it was cool to chat with you uh, we still have to meet in person <laughs> yeah someday someday um, where are you living California, I'm in California, um, in a in a town, Sacramento, the capital, um, but it's up north. A lot of people think I'm down south, but I'm in the north. <laughs> okay, cool. I was just in California, but in San Diego, so not quite. I know. Same. Yeah. I wish I could hop over there, but San Diego is like a ten-hour drive. California is huge. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that that uh, geography a little bit, a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well. Um, yeah, thanks again. That was awesome. I will um, I'll send you over all the links when this is all ready. And if anyone has any questions afterwards, this video will stay live in the Facebook group. And Sharice is in there, so she'll yes. be able to see your questions rolling in there, too. Okay. All righty. Well, I will yeah, let you know. Thanks, go. everyone. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye.